for a topic we've been talking about ooh, since the dawn of Science Friday 25 years ago, artificial intelligence. The field is on the move this year with some striking examples of what the future could hold. We have a robot surgeon beating a human at stitching a pig's intestines. Self-driving cars are now answering Uber calls in Pittsburgh. And as robots get smarter, they learn more about how we work, start doing more things for themselves. We've heard warnings from futurists like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking that superintelligence could escape our control. How do we ensure that AI developments are as beneficial as possible? Well, a new center launched by the University of California at Berkeley proposes to focus on ensuring AI is compatible with our needs while keeping robots under our control, even as they get more advanced. Berkeley computer science professor Stuart Russell is leading the center. Welcome back, Dr. Russell. Thank you for having me. And based at Stanford, another group is studying the achievements and potential of artificial intelligence for the next 100 years. It's, it's the AI 100 Project's first report, which is now out, and it looks at the potential properly channeled AI could have for the year 2030. The lead author of that report, Dr. Peter Stone, is a computer science professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Dr. Stone. Thank you. And if you'd like to talk about how do we make most of AI, how do we take advantage of it, AI's potential, give us a tweet. Our tweet is at SciFry. You can tweet us there. How do we make the most of AI's potential? Tweet us at SciFry. Uh, Dr. Russell, how do you define human compatibility AI? So what we really want to do is make sure that uh, AI systems are provably beneficial specifically to humans. Um, and... So I need to unpack that a little bit, if you don't mind. No, go right ahead. Um, so first of all, I think we all understand that AI is about making machines intelligent, and that's basically a good thing. Uh, dumb machines are not all that useful. Uh, and we already see many of these benefits that you mentioned. And as we approach human-level AI, uh, the ability of machines to solve a wide range of problems and learn all kinds of uh, new subjects, uh, then I think that will really represent a, a dramatic change in the progress of history because you know, history is really the result of our minds uh, operating in the world. Uh, and if we have access to substantially greater intelligence that we can use as a tool, uh, then that's going to change the direction of history uh, and hopefully for the better. So, But why do we need a center for human compatibility? Can't we just say that AI is already human compatible? It does stuff for us? It... Uh, so, yes, so far we've focused on very restricted tasks like playing chess. Uh, but if, if you're Gary Kasparov, <laughs> right, was, was it a good thing that Deep Blue beat you? Right. From, from Gary's point of view, probably not. Uh, and maybe that illustrates the Well, they're the good issue. at sweeping the floors, too. We got those robots that sweep floors, whatever. And they're good at driving right. us around until they crash into the side of a, of a truck and kill the driver. Mm -hmm. Um so the real issue, I think, if you ask uh, if you ask an AI researcher what do we mean by AI, not just the the lay version making machines intelligent, but the technical version, uh, it means making machines that can optimally achieve objectives. And then you say, well, what objectives? And the AI researcher will say, well, that's not my job. That's your job to figure out what your objective is and put it into the machine. And as long as we're putting in small, simple objectives like win the game of chess or you know, drive to the airport. Uh, there isn't too much of an issue. But if you put in objectives like uh, make my company as profitable as possible or uh, end hu hunger for humans, yeah. well, there are different ways of doing that. We can end hunger by ending humans. Uh, if you ask King Midas, uh, he'll tell you, no, it's very easy for humans to misspecify the objective. He said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. And he got his food and his drink turned to gold, and he was very unhappy, and he died miserable. Uh, so the real issue is that AI is only human compatible if the objectives are consistent with what humans really want. Mm -hmm. It's too late when we put in an objective like end human hunger uh, to find out that the machine is busily exterminating humans so that they won't be hungry anymore. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a real bummer. Uh, so, um, well, so what we're trying to do is, is change the definition of AI so that uh, 
getting the right objectives actually becomes part of the job of the field and it yeah. isn't just left to the user to specify. Peter, maybe you can help us hone in on some of the objectives that you see. What are we looking at as you, as you look past and future about AI and human compatibility? What are the, some of the biggest areas of opportunity right now? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and that was one of the the main uh, focus areas for the for the AI 100 report that we that we came out with. We were given the charge to think ahead to the year 2030, and um, come up with the likely influences of artificial intelligence technologies um, on a typical North American city by the year 2030. And before I go into the areas that we uh, that we focused on, I do think it's important to uh, to say that. In contrast to what uh, Professor Russell was just saying, one, one of the leaping off points for, for the report was to observe that at least um, to the, in, the, in the present day, there is no sort of one artificial intelligence. It's not, AI is not one thing. Rather, it's a co collection of technologies that require special um, focus and research towards every, every application. So there, isn't, there doesn't exist right now um, and we don't anticipate uh, in the foreseeable future, at least in the near future, um, a machine that could be given any goal. But rather, there are you know, technologies that are focused on particular areas. And so the areas we looked at um, in our report were uh, starting by the one that's probably front and center in everyone's attention right now is transportation. It's clear that, that uh, there's progress in autonomous vehicles and in other areas of transportation where AI technologies have a, a huge potential to make an impact in the relatively near term. Um, but there's also great opportunities in healthcare, home and service robots, education, public safety and security, um, employment in the workplace, and, uh, and entertainment. And in each of these, there's, there's great um, potential for AI technologies to improve our lives, um, as Professor Russell was saying. Um, and uh, and also, um, but there's also barriers and both technical challenges in each of these in these, each of these domains that are sort of unique to each domain, and also social and political barriers that need to be overcome if they're going to achieve their full potential. Is that why you, uh, we we should bring social scientists in to this conversation about deciding where AI should be going? Yeah, I think. I mean, it's uh, this is a conversation that needs to happen um, among. Um, Technologists, but also policymakers and politicians, mm -hmm. social scientists, economists, um, and on our uh, on our panel, we had people sort of representing all of those those areas, um, because you know I think I think for example, there's um, there is a lot of concern, I think legitimate concern that that AI technologies will affect the uh, the employment landscape and the um, the job landscape and. Um, Probably not by replacing lots of jobs in the near term, but rather changing the um, changing the nature of, of of certain jobs. For instance, physicians um, will certainly not in the near term be entirely be replaced by AI technologies, but there will be um, tools and new tools and skills that they'll uh, that they'll have at their fingertips and be able to use. Um, but they'll need to be able to. Uh, we'll need to be able to make sure that that there is enough transparency that the physicians and the patients are able to trust the recommendations that are made by by these technologies. And when it comes to the economy, um, you know, th there's there's a lot of potential for greater productivity as a whole by society. But it will. It, there there is also you know danger that there could be even greater concentration of wealth in a smaller number of people's hands. And if we you know we need to yeah. start the conversation now about how to sort of make sure that, that the, the wealth that's created by AI technologies is, uh, is treated um, fairly and equitably. In fact, I have a, there are some tweets coming in about that. Um, Mohammed Arthur writes, uh, most programmers are still wealthy white men. How do we make AI better for all people? Uh, Stuart, you got any suggestion? Uh, maybe curricula change? Or? Well, I, I think there is a very big issue with... Um, the demographics of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, I wouldn't say white, I would say white and Asian. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the technology is, is spreading throughout the world and different populations are, are going to be adopting it and becoming expert in it. Um, but I, I do see a lot of people saying, well, you know, it's great that robo robots are going to do all the work because then we can have a guaranteed basic income uh, and anyone who doesn't want to work doesn't have to work. Uh, 
to me, this is just a recipe for disaster because um, what you end up with is a society of uh, a, th a thin layer of extremely rich owners of technology, uh, a layer of people who serve their personal needs, uh, and then the rest of the population is fed and housed and entertained uh, and pretty much left to their own devices and doesn't fu have a real function in society. That's not a vision of the future that I, for one, would welcome at all. So we really have to think very hard about what the future shape of an economy is going to be when the material needs of the population can largely be met by fully automated systems. What's the, what's the best way of, of teaching a robot? There are a lot of different ways. Uh, Peter, for example, works in an area called reinforcement learning, uh, which means that essentially you, uh, you give the robot uh, a virtual lump of sugar when it succeeds in, or at least partially succeeds in a task, and you uh, you know, you wrap it with uh, wrap it on the knuckles when it doesn't do it right. So this is uh, reward and punishment, and uh, that process can be very effective in getting a robot to to learn various tasks, assuming that the human knows when to supply the sugar and when to supply the the punishment. Peter, um, you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, what about having robots watch what we do? And so that's a, that, yeah, that's a, so there's, there's many different ways of communicating um, sort of the teaching signal. So one is by just a reward signal, as Stuart was talking about. There is also an area um, of, of research um, called learning from demonstration, where, uh, well, yeah, the robot watches examples of successful behaviors, and this is an active research area as well. There's also, um, so, you know, there's, there's a channel of uh, reward signal. There's a channel of... of um, demonstrations. There can also be advice, watching, you know, watching a robot or a, a program um, do a task and provide it uh, a, more, a, a richer feedback than just good, good robot or bad robot, but more, uh, you know, next time you're in that situation, try, you know, try doing X instead of mm -hmm. Y. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Here in uh, broadcasting from KQED in San Francisco with uh, Stuart Russell of UC Berkeley and Peter Stone of the uh, University of Texas uh, at Austin. Do we want to teach robots morality? And whose morality do we teach it? Uh, yes, and in some sense, everyone's. Um, so one of the objectives of our center is actually to... Uh, to get robots to have the right objective so they don't go off and do things that make us unhappy after the fact. Uh, and there's a, there's a process which is related to uh, the idea of learning from demonstrations that Peter just mentioned. Uh, it's called inverse reinforcement learning. It's sort of the opposite of the reward and punishment idea. Uh, and so what that means is you observe a human's behavior and you try to figure out what objectives the human is trying to achieve. Um, so, for example, if, if I get up in the morning and I struggle downstairs with my eyes half closed and I, I press buttons on a funny looking machine and I ma it makes grinding and hissing and steaming noises uh, and then this brown liquid comes out and then I feel happy, right? The robot should be able to figure out that my objective in all this is to get a cup of coffee and then perhaps the next morning it will make the coffee for me and bring it to me in bed. So that's a very simple example. Um, we would like this process to... Uh, to extend so that eventually machines understand the, the full spectrum of human objectives so that, for example, when we ask it to end hunger, it doesn't go off and exterminate everyone uh, so they stop being hungry. But, we don't uh, but as you were saying before, we don't expect the machine that makes us coffee to be the same machine that's going to take on hunger for the whole world. So I think it's, it's a spectrum. Uh, one of the kinds of systems that people are very interested in building right now uh, you know, within the next five years, I think we'll see lots of products, and we're already seeing partial products, is the digital personal assistant. So that's an AI system that looks after your day-to-day -day life, your calendar, you know, books your travel. You know, some executives have uh, very well-trained and expensive assistants mm -hmm. who do all this stuff for them. Uh, but in fact, we could make this available to pretty much every human being on the planet for, you know, 99 or 29 cents a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine what that system is going to do. So you want to go to a meeting and you say, okay, I want to <clears throat> just book me into the, the closest hotel. So does it book you into the closest hotel where the only room available is the $2,000 a night presidential suite? 
or does it put you in you know, the Hampton Inn down the road for 115. Well, that depends on your preferences. Not so, that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it, it, you, you might have one preference or the other. And yeah. out of the box, the system doesn't know much about you and your preferences. So one of the main things these systems will have to do is to learn the preferences of the individual in order to make good decisions on their behalf and also to make decisions that don't mm. negatively affect other people. Um, so you might say, I, I am very jealous of my calendar. I don't like too many people making appointments, but, you know, then I'm a professor. That means there's a long line of students who can't get their forms signed and can't get into classes and so on. So you have to take into account right. preferences of other people. It starts to get very complicated, uh, and those are the kinds of problems that we will see in the near term, uh, let alone the problems of uh, exterminating the human oh, race by accident. Peter, the, the AI, uh, AI 100 report warns us against unnecessary fear and suspicion of AI. How do you... You know, with, with 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 futurists like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking warning us of not to trust AI. How do we trust AI? How do we get to trust it? Yeah, I mean, that's you know, there there are various uh, ways to to um, instill trust. There's um, you know, one is transparency. So you know, making sure that people understand what how something is programmed and. Um, and what the, if it's trained or if there's learning involved, what data it's, it's trained on. Going back to the, the point on, on morality, um, and this is one of the reasons that the center at, at Berkeley that Stuart's leading is, is very timely, is that there's, um, you know, as autonomous cars come into um, to existence, decisions that never had to be made explicitly are going to have to be made explicitly. And, you know, that's, that's where the morality comes in. People talk a lot about the trolley problem. If a car has to make a choice between you know, saving its uh, the uh, passenger inside the car versus pedestrians outside the car. That's never been a, something that we've no. had to explicitly decide about. Um, but with an autonomous car, that somebody's going to need to program that morality, and we need to decide as a society, you know, what are the what are the right decisions. Well, but another way for for I, I got I, I got I got to break uh, my 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 programming inside of me says I got to say goodbye. So. Um, I want to thank both of you. It's a great story. We'll get back to this. Dr. Stuart Russell, computer science professor, University of California, Berkeley. Peter Stone, computer science professor, UC uh, Texas at Austin.